So why do ResNets work so well? Let's go through one example that illustrates why ResNets work so well, at least in the sense of how you can make them deeper and deeper without really hurting your ability to at least get them to do well on the training set. And hopefully, as you've understood from the uh, third course in this sequence, doing well on the training set is usually a prerequisite to doing well on your holdout or on your dev or on your test sets. So being able to at least train a ResNet to do well on a training set um, is a good first step toward that. Let's look at an example. What we saw in the last video was that if you make a network deeper, it can hurt your ability to train the network to do well on the training set. And that's why sometimes you don't want a network that is too deep. But this is not true, or at least it's much less true when you're training a ResNet. So let's go through an example. Let's say you have X feeding in to some big neural network and this outputs some activation AL. Let's say for this example that you're going to modify the neural network to make it a little bit deeper. So you do the same big NN and this outputs AL and we're going to add a couple extra layers to this network. So let's add one layer there and another layer there. And this will output A L plus 2. Only let's make this a ResNet block, a residual block, with that extra shortcut. And for the sake of argument, let's say throughout this network we're using um, the ReLU activation function, so all the activations are going to be you know, greater than or equal to zero, with the positive exception of uh, the input x, right? because the ReLU activation outputs numbers that are either zero or positive. Now let's look at what AL plus 2 will be. To copy the expression from um, the previous video, AL plus 2 will be ReLU applied to Z L plus 2 and then plus AL, where this addition of AL comes from the um, short circuit or from the skip connection that we just added. And if we expand this out, this is equal to G of WL plus 2 times A of L plus 1 plus BL plus 2, so that's ZL plus 2 is equal to that, plus AL. Now notice something, if you're using L2 regularization or weight decay, that will tend to shrink the value of WL plus 2. Um, if you're applying weight decay to B, that will also shrink this, although I guess in practice sometimes you do and sometimes you don't apply weight decay to B. But W is really the key uh, term to pay attention to here. And if WL plus 2 is equal to 0, and let's say for the sake of argument that B is also equal to zero, then these terms go away because they're equal to zero, and then G of AL, this is just equal to AL, right? Because uh, we assumed we're using the value activation function, and so all the activations are non-negative, and so G of AL is the value applied to a non-negative quantity, so you just get back AL. So what this shows is that the identity function is easy for a residual block to learn. And it's easy to get AL plus 2 equal to AL because of this skip connection. And what that means is that adding these two layers to the neural network, it doesn't really hurt your neural network's ability to do as well as this simpler network without these two extra layers, because it's quite easy for it to learn the identity function, to just copy AL to AL plus 2 using, despite the addition of these two layers. And this is why adding two extra layers, adding this residual block uh, to the uh, somewhere in the middle or to the end of this big neural network, it doesn't hurt performance. But of course, our goal is to not just not hurt performance, is to help performance. And so you can imagine that if um, all of these hidden units, if they actually learn something useful, then maybe you can do even better than learning the identity function.
And what goes wrong in very deep play nets, in very deep networks without these residual, these skip connections, is that when you make the network deeper and deeper, it's actually very difficult for it to choose parameters that learn even the identity function, which is why a lot of layers end up making your result worse rather than making your result better. And I think the main reason the residual network works is that it's so easy for these extra layers to learn the residual con to learn the identity function that you're kind of guaranteed that it doesn't hurt performance. And then you know a lot of the time you maybe get lucky and it even helps performance, or at least it's easier to go from a decent baseline of not hurting performance and then gradient descent can only improve the solution from there. So one more detail in the residual network that's worth discussing, which is through this addition here. We're assuming that ZL plus 2 and AL have the same dimension. And so what you see in ResNets is a lot of uh, use of same convolutions so that the dimension of this is equal to the dimension, I guess, of this layer or of the output layer. So they can actually do this um, short circuit connection because the same convolution preserves dimensions and so it makes it easier for you to, you know, carry out, to have this uh, short circuit and then carry out this addition of two equal dimension vectors. Um, in case the input and output have different dimensions, so for example, if this is 128 dimensional and uh, Z, or therefore AL is 256 dimensional, as an example, what you would do is add an extra matrix, we call that WS over here, and WS in this example would be a uh, 256 by 128 dimensional matrix. So then WS times AL becomes uh, 256 dimensional. And this addition is now between two 256 dimensional vectors. And there are a few things you could do with WS. It could be a matrix of parameters to be learned. It could be a fixed matrix that just implements zero padding. So it takes AL and then um, uh, zero pads it to be 256 dimensional and either of those versions I guess could work. So finally let's take a look at ResNets on images. So these are images I got from the paper by Her et al. Um, this is an example of a play network and uh, in, in which you input an image and then have a number of uh, conv layers until eventually you have a uh, softmax output at the end. To turn this into a ResNet, you add those extra skip connections. And I'll just mention a few details. There are a lot of 3x3 three three convolutions here, and all these, most of these are 3x3 three three same convolutions. Um, and that's why you're adding you know, equal dimension feature vectors. So rather than a fully connected layer, these are actually convolutional layers, but because they're the same convolutions, the dimension is preserved. And so the ZL plus 2 um, plus AL right, addition makes sense. And similar to what you've seen in a lot of networks before, you have a bunch of convolutional layers, and then in, there are occasionally pooling layers as well, or pooling or pooling-like layers. And whenever one of those things happen, then you need to make an adjustment to the dimension, which we saw on the previous slide you can do with the matrix WS. And then as is common in these networks, you have conf, 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 pool, conf, 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 pool, conf, 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 pool. And then at the end, you know, have a fully connected layer that then makes a prediction using a softmax. So that's it for ResNets. Um, next, there's a very interesting idea behind using neural networks with one by one filters, one by one convolutions. So what good is a one by one convolution? Let's take a look at the next video.